That's yeah, it right there. Right. Okay, that's coming right into West Little Rock, yep. down right. to the south of Rodney Parham. Right there. Hold up. Right here. Here we go. Moving into West Little Rock on the southwest, just south of Rodney Parham, folks. This is coming up. I'm trying to think of some of the locations. Markham, West Markham, uh, Bowman. Yeah, in that area, right. Uh, uh, Asbury, Canis, Woodland. Uh, Big time debris. You got debris? All right, we need to. We yeah, I see the left. rapid movement. The left, yeah. We have a significant tornado on the ground in Little Rock. From the station that's on your side, this is a Channel 7 News Town Hall Special, Tornado Recovery and Restoration. And now, here is your moderator, Channel 7's Chris May. Well, hello to you and welcome to this KATV Town Hall event. If you live or work in Central Arkansas, you remember exactly where you were on the afternoon of March 31st of 2023. A tornado that the National Weather Service instantly described as catastrophic fell from the sky in West Little Rock and cut a path of destruction nearly 35 miles long. It claimed homes and businesses in Little Rock, North Little Rock, Sherwood, and Jacksonville. And all of those cities remain on the road to recovery today. With that in mind, we have invited the mayors of those four cities to join us for a discussion about that day, all that has happened since, and what is ahead, and we are pleased that they all accepted. Thanks so much for being here. Sherwood Mayor Mary Jo High Townsell, uh, Jacksonville Mayor Jeff Elmore, North Little Rock Mayor Terry Hartwick, and uh, Little Rock Mayor Frank Scott Jr. Great to be with all of you today. Nice Thanks to be for with being you. here. Thank, Thank you. You know, preparing for this, I never imagined that we would all be getting together about 48 hours after another significant storm uh, to hit central Arkansas. So let me ask uh, each of you, how has this latest bout of severe weather affected your city? Uh, Mayor High Council, we'll start with you. Well, um, initially you had the infrastructure. We had roads that were blocked, um, trees down. We did have trees significantly fall on homes. Um, and then the power outage with the, the heat wave. So we are... Um, we work with three different utility companies, Entergy, First Electric, and North Little Rock Electric. They've all been great um, about getting power restored as quickly as possible. I think that is the, the big thing. So okay. is Mayor Elmore? Uh, it's, it's been interesting because not only do we worry about our people and our residents, but I've also got Little Rock Air Force Base there. And right. so they were significantly impacted also you know, by the storm. And I was speaking with the base commander the other night, and some of the C-130s are actually moved as much as two feet mm. uh, from where they are initially parked just from the wind. So uh, it has affected us in lots of different ways. Unbelievable. Mayor Hartwick? Well, we started out and just talked to the tornado. We had 15,000 people out of electricity doing that. The other night, 27,000 people without power. So it's been a it's been an ongoing effort. Like we said, we've been we're still trying to finish up from the tornado, then this comes through. So it's been, again, a very trying time for our city. But again, our electric department, and we have Jonesboro down there. We have Conway here. We got Bentonville coming down. So with those other electric departments, we've taken it from 27,000. I think the last I heard just a while ago from Mary is around 3,000 still without power. So. It's been an ordeal, I can tell you. The city of Little Rock fared a little bit better than most, Mayor Scott? Uh, we definitely did. We're grateful for that, but also share our concern for our other cities that are within the central Arkansas region and stand ready to always be assistance. And uh, now we did have some uh, light failures and things of that nature, but grateful that Energy Arkansas was able to get us back up rather quickly. The storm was certainly a reminder that it doesn't take a tornado to cause significant damage. Uh, but that is exactly what we had back on March 31st. And let, let's turn our attention uh, to that day. Uh, take us back, uh, if you will. Where were all of you when that tornado rolled in, Mayor Elmore? Oh. I was at City Hall. We were open. It was a normal day. And then as we saw the weather, started watching, hearing what could be coming, we went ahead and closed City Hall at noon that day. And our schools had closed and so went and dismissed our employees. So allowed them to, to get away and go home, be safe, we're in their safe spot. So uh, I had just gotten home and I was there with my sons and when the storm came through and uh, it was interesting to watch. We fortunately have a storm shelter and we were in and out of that outside watching a little bit, moved the shelter when needed, but so I had just gotten home that day when, when it hit. Shelter's a great thing to have. You were at City Hall as well? I was at City Hall watching y'all. Um, I was listening, I had the TV on. Um, I sit and watched it come across the river and I heard y'all say, it's now hitting Burns Park. And I went, oh, I won't mm. tell you what I said, but right after it hit, we um, called 38 departments. We've all went to the Justice Building. 
we started working the problem. We stayed up to about 12 o'clock that night, and we knew we had a contract with a company called Crowder Gulf. So they were actually on site Saturday, and we started picking up the debris that next Tuesday. But um, it was hard to watch. I mean, I grew up in Burns Park, but one of those things. And the Thursday before the Friday, I was in a ride out there dedicating two new rides. Uh, we haven't seen that ride since. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's, it's quite catastrophic. Mr. Scott, where were you? Well, for me, it was twofold. I was just coming back from a site visit in Chanel area uh, for a traffic light, uh, of all huh. things. And so I was about a half an hour ahead of the storm, and I got a phone call from the team said, hey, I know you're out that way. You need to get back to City Hall. And mm -hmm. so I uh, rushed back to City Hall, and probably within 10 minutes of uh, walking into City Hall, uh, it hit, and I was bunkered down with uh, at least 70 employees uh, in our basement area. And as soon as it hit uh, and we got the clear go-ahead, uh, my team and I raced to uh, the quickly stood up incident command center at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And so I just want to give uh, just great kudos to the men and women of the Little Rock Police Department, Fire Department, Public Works Department, Parks Department, our entire city team, because uh, we quickly stood up that incident command center within minutes of the tornado hitting. Uh, Mayor Hyde Townsend, what were you doing when this all rolled in? So uh, I made the mistake of actually trying to leave town the one and only time that um, since I was sworn in. We were an hour outside of St. Louis trying to go to my son's um, college sports banquet. Mm -hmm. And I was on the phone constantly with City Hall and uh, with the team and so forth. And they said the debris was flying and told everybody to take shelter. And then the next call I got was by a city council member who said that um, Club Road had been hit. And I told my husband, pull over, we switch places. I took the wheel and off we went and was back uh, before our press conference that night. But uh, we've got a wonderful staff. Our police chief immediately set up um, our center over at City Hall and you know, off we went in terms of was recovery. It, was there a moment that you had, be it in the first few minutes, the first few hours, the first few days of this crisis that that really lets you know that you were dealing with with pretty much a once in a lifetime event that was going to require a really extraordinary response. What what was that moment for you, Mayor Harp? Well, I we had a, a tornado that hit when Pat Hayes was uh, mayor that hit the airport out there, but nothing like this. So I've had a little experience with what we do. But again, nothing like this. So when I got to Burns Park about, I guess it would have been four or five o'clock doing an interview, I think, with you guys. What I really noticed was a stop sign. And you know how think about how strong that metal is, that it was actually, the sign was still great, but it looked like some big man just twisted it. From there you go down to Sonora, the governor actually has a lady who works for her that lives in there. So I toured it, went on up Rancho State. So that's when I started going, this is something that I have never seen before. So they called it, I guess, EF3. Well, I don't want to see EF4 if that's the case. Cause, mm -hmm. And then you saw the people. What we're really thankful for, I think all of us is, if you're going to have a tournament at 2.30 when everybody's still in school and everybody's at work, because really I think West Memphis is the only one that had a, I mean, when is the only one that had a death in the place. So thankful for that. We all kind of got together and we just got to work. What was that moment for you that, that told you this was something different? Uh, to piggyback on Mayor Hart, I think it's by the grace of God uh, that no one died here in the central Arkansas region. Uh, and to truly see uh, what transpired over those minutes uh, yeah. here in the, in the state capital city and all of the central Arkansas region, uh, for me was um, us racing to Emmanuel Baptist Church and seeing all the debris. Uh, but honestly, uh, when you see you know, the, the amount of damage in the areas of, of Shackleford, Colony West, uh, Walnut Valley, Green Mountain, um, and, and the amount of trees yeah. that were uprooted. And if, if you've ever driven down 430, uh, you couldn't see Kingwood. You couldn't see uh, those neighborhoods. And because we had so many trees, we lost thousands of trees. And just to see that be uprooted, you saw what kind of impact that it had. <coughs> on our city, on all of our cities, uh, that this is something, uh, as he said, that, you know, we haven't seen a, a F4, but we were one mile per hour less than the F4.
Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was how devastating the impact it was. You mentioned experience. You, had, you were about halfway through your, your second go-round in office. You right. had just started a second term. The two of you were, were both fairly new to office at the time, right? I think you were Brandon. both in about yeah. 60 days. So what do, you, what do you do as new mayors in those first few minutes to, to stand up what you know is going to have to be an incredible response to this? Um, I will say I'm lucky in that my husband's the former mayor of Conway, so, you know, he has some experience and his former police chief is um, head of Adam, so that was helpful, but I, I'm sure, I know I was running on adrenaline for days, it felt like. I mean, I first came into the town, it, it kind of looks like a war zone, mm -hmm. you know, um, when you saw all the damage and, and people were you know, kind of in shock, but I will say I was very thankful um, for our neighbor. And I, at one point, my, I, th I believe it was on Sunday, my public works director called me up and said, where do I put all of this? And I said, I have no idea. And so I, I called up um, AJ and then AJ referred me over to the county and he called me up and said, Mayor, no offense, but we got our hands full. You got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, residents said, well, I heard they're taking it over to the North Little Rock Airport. Can we take it there? And I said, not without calling Mayor Hardwick. And I called him up. He's like, no, 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 don't. You can't take it to the airport, but come on over and uh, we'll walk you through what you need to do. And that was just such a huge help. And it really, the, the regionalism, you know, we were able to loan police officers to North Little Rock and Jacksonville. North Little Rock, with their experience, were able to help us some, but I just think it's that, you know, coming together and really working as a region and providing services to one another was just amazing. Mayor Elmer, what, what was the challenge of, of, of standing up a response for the city of Jacksonville? Um, the challenge initially is, yes, coming from a world of no experience, you know, mm -hmm. being brand new to office, you know, taking over, you know, January 1st. Uh, what the very first thing I did that was just I stopped and prayed and just said, God, I need wisdom. You know, be with me because I can't do this alone. And so that was, you know, what it all started with. But then I, just, I found myself surrounded by great people, uh, best department directors that, you know, I could ask for. And uh, people began calling and calling me and reaching out and saying, hey, what can we do to help here? Have you done this? Have you done this? Thank you. You know, so that was uh, it. Honestly, it was an immediate answer to prayer mm -hmm. uh, in that situation because, you know, just me with uh, my lack of knowledge and dealing with a, you know, a national level disaster. <laughs> so it was, you know, a trial by fire and very quick. So. Take us along for the ride when you were first able to kind of get out and see the damage. And, and Mayor Scott, in Little Rock, it started in West Little Rock, the Calais Forest Departments, mm -hmm. and all the destruction going all the way through to Kamak Village to the north before it crossed the river. What did you see? What were you hearing from people that you were talking to? So we were very intentional to make certain that we get out uh, with the residents of Little Rock to make certain that one, they, should, they saw uh, their leadership uh, with them uh, to be helpful, to be a listening ear, uh, to be a comfort place. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's just unreal. You talk about Cali Apartments. Uh, I've never been in a war zone, but... Uh, from what I've heard, it, 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 if Calais apartment wasn't close to it, it was, it was definitely close. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you see the amount of vehicles that were turned up, and, and you just look at those apartment complexes, and you, again, just say, it was the grace of God that no one died. And there were people there. Uh, and then I think the main thing was just to show that there was a plan, uh, that we were going to work the plan, that we were going to be responsive. And one of the things that you were able to see of, uh, really with the essence of Little Rock and Central Arkansas uh, was that this spirit of resilience and resourcefulness that we were going to get through this together. And in a unique way, we saw unity. Uh, yeah. That everyone right was away. Right, yeah. away. right away. Right away. Right away. And again, I, I, I just want to give the yes. shout out to uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church and to Goodwill of Arkansas, United Way, uh, Engage Little Rock, Engage Arkansas, all these nonprofit people just showed up, you know, just say, what do we need to do to help? And we were able to really uh, create this family assistance center to be a one-stop shop uh, for residents because you had families who 
didn't know where they were going to sleep, sleep that night. You had children who were in need of, of baby formula and diapers, and uh, it, it truly just showed the hand of God of us all together. Yep. Uh, Mayor High Council, uh, several neighborhoods uh, in your city hit hard. Austin Bay Court, uh, the Longstreth Apartments, when you got out and saw mm -hmm. them for yourselves, for yourself, what was it like? Um, you know, like I said, you're, you're kind of running on a drill line, but just hearing the each individual stories of these homeowners and the remarkable fact that, you know, no one was more severely hurt in our city. I mean, where like a little layer of sheetrock <laughs> saved somebody, you know, and you don't really understand how, but it, it you really did feel like, you know, we've all talked about um, feeling like we were all very fortunate and that God looked out for everybody, but you really got a sense of that. And then I think also just that desperation. It was so important. I was on top of roofs. I was going door to door. My staff did the, the same thing, just reaching out, making sure that people's needs you know, were met and doing everything you could. And sometimes they just needed a shoulder to cry on, quite honestly, and a hug. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, uh, Mayor uh, Dupree Park, there's several homes, several apartments. The First Assembly of God Church in your yes. city destroyed. Holland Bottoms uh, Wildlife Area, which is mm -hmm. uh, bordering Jacksonville, <coughs> also hit very hard. What was it like seeing that in person? Uh, disheartening, sad, you know, knowing that, you know, we have citizens in our town that just lost everything. You know, we once again, we were very fortunate and thankful that there were no lives lost. So because of it, I think we were able to operate and go about recovery in a different way, just because you did not have that part, you know, weighing on the so loss of life. But yeah, you know, Dupree Park took a major hit, uh, and that is a, a big part of our city as far as quality of life and uh, tournaments and events that go on there, Jacksonville High School Baseball plays home games there and so forth. So we had to adjust, but then there were so many residential areas where houses just totally wiped out and gone. Uh, roofs removed, uh, trees that fell on houses and split houses in two. Uh, it was, uh, impressive is not a good word, but it's the only word I think that is you know accurate, just seeing this and then realizing that nobody died. And that, that was amazing. And that was only by the grace of God that that, that took place. But. Uh, the tornado, the storm was non-discriminatory. It hit some of everybody in town and working its way through. So, but uh, echoing what, uh, what Mayor Scott said, to see our people come together was just unbelievable. Uh, all walks of life working immediately. If they did know you, it didn't matter. They were, everybody was just helping everybody, and it was it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Burns Park earlier. It went on through Amboy, through several neighborhoods into Indian Hills, I believe, close to your own home. Yeah, I missed you about five houses. Well, what what impressed you the most when you first saw the damage? I tell you real fast. Uh, when I saw the damage, is as most of us did, we started going, getting our departments together. But I knew where we wanted to take the debris was down by the soccer fields because they have these big asphalt lots. Well, then when we're doing this, I was told that we can't do it because it's in a floodplain. I got to call. I got to thinking, who can I call? Who can I call? And I got to thinking, I'll call the governor. She's been at that level before. She's been in Washington. So I made a call to her. She answered right away and said, <laughs> first of all, she said, put it there anyway. I said, no, no, if we put it there, FEMA won't pay us. She said, give me a couple hours. So after talking to her, she called back within two hours. She says, I got you a letter. Put it down on the soccer fields. They'll bypass it. So long story short, she got involved. We got FEMA. And you've heard those old stories where it says, I'm here from the federal government. I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. Believe not, they did. Yeah. And I can mm -hmm. say our governor, FEMA, Adam, all the way down. And we're still working with Crowder Guff, as, as uh, uh, Mary, Mary Jo said a while ago. Some people are last, but we had a contract, and that's what helped us. We actually had a contract with this company called Crowder Gulf, and so we kind of brought her in, and she, I think you ended up getting a contract with them, didn't you? So we did. I cannot say enough about the big old two, those big old trucks has been everywhere. They've torn up our streets, but guess what? <laughs> Debris is gone. We're finishing up with Burns Park, and as all of us have said, Samaritan's Purse. Oh, mm -hmm. they were amazing. You, you cannot say, even the volunteers that got home and started driving their chainsaws, so it's been a united front for all of us here to make this happen and clean up. I can say we're completely clean, clean our debris in the cities, the residential areas. We're back at Burns Park, and we should be completely 
out there hopefully the first week in August. So, That's great. Yeah. You, you bring up a good point that, that when a crisis like this happens, city government provides the first response right. in terms of EMTs, mm -hmm. fire, and police, but the recovery and rebuilding effort really requires the backstop of state government and, and the federal government as well. Uh, all of your experiences with those governments, uh, were they positive? How responsive were they? How supportive were they? Did they listen to your needs? Mayor Moore, we'll start they, with you. They did. Um, initially, it was a little frustrating getting just um, everybody on the same page, but that's to be expected, and especially when you've got multiple areas that have all been hit by the same storm. But uh, FEMA was fantastic. They still are. I'm meeting with them weekly, and so for update meetings yeah. and keeping us on track for all of our paperwork and so forth. But uh, Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, all of our local uh, organizations, the NAACP played a huge part in our town. First Baptist Church Jacksonville played an, an enormous role in ministering to the needs of our people and housing them and so forth. So, uh, but the the government, the different agencies, Department of Emergency Management, they've they've all been great. They they call me. I don't have to call them. They call me to check and say, hey, what can we do for you? How you know? Is there anything that you need right now? So, very thankful for them. The city of Sherwood got that same kind of support. Absolutely, yes. Uh, the the governor was out um, that next day touring. Uh, her people were wonderful, and it, to kind of give you an example. With the storm that we just happened, no sooner did that storm go through before my phone lit up with a, a representative from the governor's office. How are y'all doing? Do you need anything? And, you know, we've been in contact with that. But they have been extremely receptive and checking in and making sure that everything's going okay. Are there any needs that you all need? And FEMA, yes, we, I'm sure we all have the weekly meetings with FEMA, kind of holding our hands through it all. So I would say, you know, through all the levels of the government, I couldn't have asked for a better response. I remember seeing you alongside Governor Sanders that night, March mm -hmm. 31st. That partnership took off quickly. Clearly, um, I just couldn't say uh, much more how great and seamless the relationship with the governor uh, during that time of crisis. As you know, um, that evening, uh, she and I held a joint press conference uh, to share uh, with the community and the region. Uh, the response, the plan of action, and how we will be moving forward together. Uh, but I think it's also notable to share not only uh, was the relationship between state and city government seamless, but it also was very seamless between state, city, and federal government. And I think, you know, we should not take it lightly that within 48 hours we had the FEMA administrator from the Biden administration in Little Rock, in uh, central Arkansas, and that was monumental. Uh, to demonstrate that we know something urgent, devastating, impactful happened here in this region. We're coming here to help. We're going to set up shop and be very responsive and provide resources. And so uh, when you take a case study to see that type of partnership uh, across, you know, several cities um, uh, with the state government led by the governor uh, and all of us as mayors, uh, you couldn't have written a better case study. And to their credit, they're still on the ground three yeah. months later. Yeah. Still yeah. here, I got to tell you something real soon. fast. Yeah. I, after that storm came through Sunday night, I sent a text to uh, the governor. I said, "Can we talk?" And I kind of listed, "We've got numbers for you." And I said, and last, "My last sentence." I said, "We got to quit meeting like this." And she started <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> Says, "I agree. We got to quit meeting like this." So well, in great. addition to, to all that assistance, I know that a lot of. Uh, nonprofits, oh, yeah. uh, uh -huh. individual donors, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, uh, local businesses, private sector businesses really stepped up to help. Talk about the contribution they made to this effort. Well, I, I think one of the things that we've shared, again, whether it's American Red Cross, Engage Arkansas, Goodwill um, Industries of Arkansas, uh, to Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, Samaritan's Purse, uh, to every resident that stepped up. Uh, then. Uh, our the Little Rock Police Department, Fire Department, Parks Department, Public Works, uh, every, it was all hands on deck. Uh, and one of the things we're most proud of is that, you know, with a ma matter of several days, a few days rather, that we were able to raise through our Little Rock Cares Fund close to $600,000 that we've de deployed back into the community uh, through organizations who were there up front. Uh, as well as direct pay assistance and ensure all those dollars, there's no administrative uh, fees or anything going from that nature, all those going back into the community. Uh, but to see that type of operation 
set up in a matter of you know minutes to an hour for again the family assistance center uh, and then all that was going on it just shows what we all can do when we communicate we collaborate and we show compassion what is the private sector support meant in your cities well on the the private sector just I would say we had restaurants and banks uh, we coordinated so that there were lunches and dinners available um, you know, that first week so that people had places where they could go. Um, and then on the nonprofits, we had Samaritan's Purse actually headquartered in, in Sherwood. We had over 10,000 volunteer hours logged in, and those are just the ones that we logged in. We know it far exceeded that, but those were just volunteer hours. That doesn't even talk about all the employees and everything else. One thing I'd like to say is I had never heard so many chainsaws in my life. I thought, thank <laughs> no, God we're in the South. No. When that first morning, everywhere, it was the buzzing of chainsaws. You know, it was just people came out everywhere with their chainsaws and were just helping anybody and everybody. But, you know, the Mennonite men's ministry, I mean, the, the Texas Baptist men's ministry, I mean, there were just so many that came in and just did a phenomenal job. And we're able to handle things that we just could not have. You know, you think of those giant trees mm -hmm. and be able to get those root balls and stumps out. We don't have that kind of equipment, but they did, and they knew how to do it. So. I, I can recall walking around my own neighborhood uh, the day after the storm, and already in front of almost every home, there were piles of debris eight yeah. feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, how, how are we ever going to get back to normal? Yeah. Because before you can rebuild, you have mm -hmm. to clean all that up. And I know that all four of you have, have undertaken extraordinary efforts uh, to make sure that's happened. Where do we stand now in the cleanup process in our individual cities? Mayor, we'll start with you. Our cleanup has gone great. Uh, just like North Little Rock and Terry was saying a while ago, we're pretty much done with the debris removal. There's still a couple of little pockets of spots that you know we're still working on but for the most part we're done we've moved on to that rebuilding phase and uh, trying to put things better than they were before you know we just don't we don't want to build it like it was but we want to make things better and move the city forward so we're using this as an opportunity uh, to be able to do that mayor harpick well as i said a while ago debris in the residential is gone it's burns park as as frank said a while ago the trees uh, I guess I said when it hit, we lost 10,000 trees. That's not true. We lost probably 15 to 20,000. Oh, wow. it, it's much, much more than that. You just can't imagine. When it came over from Little Rock, hit that river, it was four or 500 yards wide, but when it came, hit that river, it exploded. I mean, there's 1,000 yard swaps there. So we're there. We're, I, can, I can say that I think August 6th, around that first week in August, will be completely clean with Grower Gulf. Now it's the rebuilding part. Um, but as we've said all along with all of us here, we've got so much help and so much support. We'll get it back and probably better than it was, but it's just going to take a while. It, to see Burns Park to go from these trees that have been, what, 50, 60 years old? They're not there anymore, so it's, you know, I won't ever see the big ones again, but mm -hmm. we're going to start with that, and I think that's the right way. You can see on TV now that some of the cleanup, our baseball fields are gone, so... I'm, I'm excited about where we can, what we can make it again. All of us is being in our position that we're in. In Little Rock, the, the deadline to get debris curbside was this past Sunday, so the cleanup continues, but where does it stand right now? Uh, as you know, Little Rock was probably the most devastated when it comes to the type of damage, close to 3,000 structures that were impacted um, across the entryway into West Little Rock. Uh, and with that being said, we've already picked up close to 500,000 cubic yards of weights. And so when you think about that, to put that in from a picture standpoint, that's uh, somewhere around 5,000 football fields. Uh, that's been transitioned from Reservoir Park, where we initially put a lot of our debris to our landfill. Uh, we just completed our contract with uh, DRC Emergency Services, and uh, the city's expected to spend close to $10 million uh, in debris removal. Uh, and so we're, we're grateful for the amount of work that's already been done. Uh, we should, by the latter part of this summer, be completely cleared uh, so we can really start the rebuilding phase. But I think one of the things that we're, we're all concerned about uh, is that while we're entering this rebuilding phase, I know for certain from a Little Rock perspective is we all have to be concerned about affordable housing. Mm 
Uh, and so particularly in Little Rock, you had a lot of uh, those homes that were either almost paid for or individuals may have been on fixed income. And so while they may be fortunate to receive the insurance check, but the average price range in West Little Rock right now, the average home right now is about 375000 So that's pretty, that's pretty steep. And so uh, we're really putting our pen to pad to figure out what we need to do from the rebuilding phase to help with infrastructure to kind of lessen some of those costs as we look forward to the future. In the city of Sherwood, the cleanup is yeah, wrapped up? Yeah, we, we completed in May. Um, and so uh, now <laughs> we're in our second cleanup phase with the, the storm that just came through. Um, same thing in terms of rebuilding. We um, last month through we had city council pass to where we can do some rezoning of some areas that were residential, but really should be you know commercial. So we waived those fees and are are doing some replatting, waiving of fees, those type of things. So as everyone mentioned, so that when we come back, we can come back stronger than what we once were and. We talked uh, before we came on the air in terms of we're getting ready to, to finally have to start red tagging, you know, homes, which you hate mm -hmm. to do. But at some point, you know, some of these homes are just not safe and um, they become a blight in the, the neighborhood and they hurt the surrounding homes that weren't hit. And so looks like July 10th is when we're going to have to finally get serious about those type of issues. But you do hope no one comes in from out of state. You hear the stories of, you know, coming in and buying up a bunch of your local properties and these landlords and so forth. You, you don't want that to happen. And, so. and just so everyone knows, red tagging means? We have to basically say this, this structure is no longer livable. So it puts them on the clock of either you've got to bring it back up to current building standards or tear down. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but mm -hmm. I, I think this is a good time to bring some viewer questions in. Some of these questions were specific to a city, but, but I wanna ask you all about them in case sure. they apply to your city and anyone can weigh in. Jenny wrote in to ask, or to say rather, that a strip of land between her neighborhood and a highway is still littered with debris. It's not a homeowner's property, but it's an eyesore. She's asking if there are plans to pick up that kind of debris? Yeah, I would say in some areas, I think um, at, at the end of the day, from a city perspective, it's hard to explain to a resident about certain things and what a city can and cannot do. Uh, I think we all are working with the National uh, Conservancy Resource Services Agency, which is a federal government, it's alphabet soup, uh, but long story short, it's from the USDA. And so many times there are private areas where we as cities cannot go on property. We cannot remove that debris. It's up to those individuals who may own that property or has it within their purview. Uh, the city of Little Rock just received a, a million dollar uh, grant to do that for some uh, areas within the city. Okay, anyone else dealing with similar? Same thing. Okay. Uh, what we're doing, we're looking at all pieces. You want to get it back to normal, for instance, as fast as possible. But there are areas, as Frank said, that are on private property. But if you can get to that easement area, we're going to take care of it. Simple mm -hmm. as that. I mean, that's exactly. easement areas. And so it just it just tries to get your city back to looking like it was. I thought the first thing, I don't mean to over talk, but I thought the first thing is to try to get our cities back to being as normal as possible. Playing ball, playing golf, hitting a tennis ball, riding the bikes. Mm -hmm. So I think we've all concentrated. But yes, to answer your question, if they'll get those easements, we're going to get it. Well, we also fielded a couple of questions about areas that lost trees that uh, may have served as sound barriers between mm -hmm. neighborhoods mm -hmm. and, and busy roadways or highways. Are there any plans to deal with noise pollution in neighborhoods that have been created by this, but perhaps new sound barriers that could be put up. Yeah. Go ahead, Frank. No, no, go no, ahead. no, no, no. Well, all, all I can say is there are areas like that right now, but the neighbors are so conscious of what they've gone through, I don't hear a lot of that problem. For instance, like you said the other day, you see the blue rooftops. Everybody's working on their home. So I think a lot of our neighbors have been more, it's, it's being improved. So as far as sound barriers, I'm not dealing with that at all. Okay. And we weren't really affected in that way. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. We, we haven't heard much uh, from a sound barrier perspective. I would say I think both uh, Terry and I are, are focused on, okay, how do we replant the right type of trees? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And so from a, a climate change perspective and also 
uh, just from an overall safety perspective, you want to ensure that the right trees are being replanted uh, for our, our collective city's present and for its future. Yeah. And so we at City of Little Rock, we're working with a number of different organizations to uh, identify grants on how we replan. Of course, we'll do whatever we need to do from a city revenue standpoint, but we have to, if, if no one knows by now that climate change is real, uh, when you have a tornado, the average tornado is on ground four minutes. This tornado was on the ground in our state 29 minutes. Mm -hmm. This might be specific to Little Rock, but Michael wrote in to say that um, with debris pickup ending, there are still homes that have not been picked up. This might actually apply to any of you, but, but he asked, how do residents who have been passed over or may have slipped through the cracks, how do they get their debris picked up without having to pay out of pocket? Well, the city of Little Rock, if you have anything on your easement we're picking up, if it hasn't been picked up, it's just only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, but anywhere to call or? 311. Mm -hmm. Us, we have what we call, probably like all C's do, we have what we call neighborhood association groups. I think in our C we have close to 19 of them. So we've assigned all those neighborhood association groups to send out, is there anything left in your neighborhood? We've gotten back, everything's clean. So, but so I'm sure there's always going to be at one, but if it's in the neighborhood, we're going to take care of it. You know, anything that that is ongoing, we'll pick up if they get it out to the curb. Their their particular day a week on their regular schedule, we'll send the truck by, and it'll pick it'll pick up. It'll take care of them. Okay, patience is a virtue. Absolutely, yeah. same thing um, in terms of Sherwood. Now, if it's too big to where we physically can't pick it up, um, say some of those massive trees. You know, we've asked that they cut it down to a size in which we we could possibly um, pick it up. I would say that um, one thing that we did do is we sent, I, I sent out my staff and we used Parks yeah, and Rec one day. We exactly. literally went door to door to door to door, um, knocking on doors, putting out flyers, making sure that people knew if you need help, we can assign you help. If you, you know, and also mm -hmm. to give them all the deadlines. So I think that went really well and that people had ample time to really know that those deadlines were coming. and. If you need assistance in getting things out to the curb, we had volunteers ready. Well, one additional question here. Um, several light poles that were knocked down <laughs> have not been replaced. Uh, Entergy, this uh, uh, viewer says, has filled in some of the holes and said that they're not going to replace them. Can they get their light poles back? Well, I think that may street lights mean a lot. <laughs> yeah. That may, in, in, in <laughs> <water>. <laughs> that may be a little rock issue because uh, <laughs> uh, none of them are, are under Energy Arkansas. We um, are, but we, we didn't. Yeah, have, yeah, we are too. Yeah. We are too but yeah. So, but. Uh, from, from that standpoint is that I think uh, Energy is a great partner and so we'll continue to work with them. There's an issue, we just need to know about it and any of us can all make that phone call. I guess North Little Rock is the only I one don't that think they'll take my yeah. call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same though in your cities as well, concerns yes. about light, light poles and um, street lights. We didn't lose as many normal, uh, just street lights. Uh, mm -hmm. It was basically the power poles, power lines, the, the support poles. Uh, and that was actually more this past weekend than it was during, exactly. during the tornado yeah. Yeah. itself. So uh, energy has been working hard to restore power to the city now. But uh, the difference between those two storms, the tornado did so much devastation. But it was confined to a path, to an area, whereas this past weekend storm, was citywide. I mean, everywhere you turn, you around a corner, you'd see trees right. down and power lines down in just different places. It was much greater in, in spectrum in that regards. Well, let's talk about the numbers in your cities now that we're three months removed from this. Uh, the, the numbers of homeowners and businesses that lost either everything or, or suffered severe damage. How do the numbers add up in your individual cities? Uh, so probably Sherwood had the least amount. We were 230 homes okay. and businesses uh, we were 400 to 500 homes and uh, 10 to 12 on the commercial side business side okay 1191 homes we're on 91 streets and that doesn't count the, count the businesses or churches or anything so quite devastating and, and I see churches down on what we call Don and Riley I can take you up to ranch estates it's never ending but they're in progress to replace them so um, it's going to be a while, Chris. It really is. But again, we're on top of it. I see the city working together. I've heard nobody saying that I, I can't do this. Right now, everybody's, and I know it's going to pop up saying, so I do agree that it's, it's challenging because you see some people that may not have the funds. I had one guy real fast call me and said, Mayor, I said, yes. He said, I was over in the Sonora area and I just sold my house. And I said, you did? He said, yeah, I got my money. 
I said, but and I'm going to sell my lot. I had a guy call mm -hmm. me. He wants to build a new new house there. So you kind of get a little bit of this. I've sold. I'm ready to go. Right. I got some money in my back pocket. And I said, where are you going? He says, I'm going to direct me an apartment in North Little Rock. So he's staying, but he's just kind of liquidating himself. Everybody has a different story. And and I think like all of us saying, we try to listen to what they say and give them good advice where to go, what we can do. But overall, people are making it out. They're, they're learning what to do and figuring it out. And FEMA has been a great support. What are the final numbers in the world? 3,000 impacted structures, which includes both residences and commercial businesses. And at the city of Little Rock, if you go to our website, we have a very detailed roadmap on all the data uh, from that. So really want to give a shout out to our chief data officer who was able to ensure that residents can look and see what's going on, where it's going on uh, from that standpoint. It is a lot of homes, though. I, I drive through the Kingwood neighborhood yeah, yeah. pretty often. And I've noticed in just the past few weeks that, that a lot of the homes that were really severely damaged, they have started mm -hmm. to knock down. Yeah. And in some of these mm -hmm. yards, they're putting up for sale signs in the lots. Um, do you have concerns as leaders that, that, that people who are having to restart their lives and do it elsewhere from where they've lived might actually leave your cities and, and move off somewhere else? And is there a way to convince them to stay or incentivize them uh, to stay in your city? Well, one of the things, Little Rock has been growing uh, the past several years. We want to continue that trajectory. Uh, we're making certain that those that are rebuilding back, whether it's residential, home, or commercial businesses, we're letting them know uh, you don't have to build to the new current uh, standards. So we're waiving that process so we can bring as much uh, positivity towards them as they're rebuilding from that standpoint. Uh, we do believe with all the great work that we've been doing from a quality of place standpoint, as we continue to make those investments, we'll continue to grow as a city. I want to keep people in Sherwood, obviously. You, you don't want them going elsewhere. How do yeah, you keep we, them? We they can really, come over to Little Rock. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, we're really not hearing of people mm -hmm. wanting to leave exactly. the city. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it's more just about, you know, trying to rebuild where they are. So. Same with you. Yeah, yes, there's, there's a sense of pride of our, our citizens, our residents, and they don't want to leave. They love Jacksonville. So many of them have been born, raised, stayed, others that have come in uh, through the military and then have decided to retire and stay. You know, there was one lady that lost her home, lost everything. She was a widow living by herself and, you know, she was able to sell after this and move to be with, you know, with her family and, you know, that I, I totally understand and, you know, wish her the best. But there's so many that they, they don't want to leave. It's home and that's where they want to be. We do know, Mayor Hartwick, that, that many of these people are still living in hotels or yeah. with other family members or in temporary housing. What, what are you all hearing from them? What, what are their needs that, that are still ongoing? And how do you get them back into permanent homes? Well, the biggest thing is, I, I will tell you, FEMA said they had put people up and actually pay for their hotel room for, I th what was it, three, six months, Frank? Is mm -hmm. that what y'all got? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, think about it. And they're getting three meals a day, so FEMA's taking a good amount of care of these people. We, again, we've, I've done like most other cities. We've waived the, the I guess, the fees, you might mm -hmm. say, make it easier for you. Um, as far as electrical, all the things you have to do, you can go back to the old standards when I have to bring them up. Some of the areas that want to put a trailer there, which we don't allow trailers in our city, but we'll waive it and give them what they call a special use to put a trailer in for, for six to nine months till you get your rest of it built. So we're, every city I know is building backwards, building over backwards to try to help these people. And that's kind of what it's all about. They got to help themselves, but we'll help them with them. Uh, so that's what I'm hearing more than anything. Uh, we, we, it's, it's, a lot of people have been there their whole life, like I have. I've lived in North Little Rock from Rose City, and here I am. I ain't going to tell you how old I am, but I'm older than some of those trees that went down. So <laughs> I don't know so, about that. Yeah. But, you know, we talked about patience, but it's got to be frustrating after all this time to still find yourself out of your home. What would you say to folks who are still in that situation? Uh, to those individuals, we want you to continue to know that the city of Little Rock is here for you in any way possible, that we can get some things done for you. Um, uh, as many have already shared, uh, in this particular process, those that are uh, receiving the assistance, there's a plan for them. Uh, they're, they are navigating through that process to get them to, whether it's to build their home, 
to rent an apartment, uh, that process is already underway. And so we haven't heard a lot of that. Now, really the, the initial, you yeah. know, first few weeks, yes, but r really things have kind of settled down from that standpoint. Again, because uh, we as cities work very collaboratively with our state, with our federal government. FEMA's done a really good job as well in providing that assistance. We focus, I think, so much on, on our neighborhoods because that is what makes up our community, and we focus on our business because that's what makes us thrive. But we talked about the, the losses in our public spaces uh, at Reservoir Park, yeah. at Murray Park, at Burns Park. Um, how soon will those public spaces get back to the point where they are usable and we can take our our families and our friends to, to enjoy you know some of the best of what yeah. Arkansas has to offer as the natural state? Uh, we were already bidding. I mean, let's take our baseball fields. We've already got a bid process, which FEMA makes you do to get the fences recovered, the light poles back. Mm -hmm. We're already in, in process now of bidding out the streets that have been torn up. So it's already ongoing in our. So I, I've said from the very beginning, let's get our people back to being as normal as possible. And that means if you want to go ride your bike, I mean, I had a lot of that going on. So I won't be able to have. Our people get on a bike trail. If they want to go all over the big damn bridge over Little Rock and come back, they can now. So that's important to get people to feel as natural to me as possible. And, and I, I want to open up the baseball fields as soon as possible. Here we got school about to get out. I'm 8, 19 years old. What do you want to do when you're 8, 19 years old? You want mm -hmm. to go play ball. So that was the first thing we got open is the ball fields, get them open. And then, of course, the golfers. I was very proud to get a golf course, tennis courts. So we had a tournament last weekend. So... I wanted people to be able to do the things they've always been doing as fast as possible. And I thought that was the most normal thing I could get done for our city. That'll be as normal as possible. Now, the damage at Reservoir Park uh, was extensive. They've done a great job of, of cleaning up Murray Park. I drive right. by it almost every day. It's our priority to come back stronger and better than ever. Uh, we are uh, actively working on our plans to get everything back to normal as possible. Uh, and so parks and recreation continues to be a top priority. Holland Bottoms Wildlife Area, we mentioned that earlier. What's the status of, of that area? Oh, <clears throat> it's actually not in our city. Okay. And so we haven't had as much direct so interaction with that. So we can take stuff there. Holland Bottoms. County. And that's, <laughs> and, and County, that's <laughs> you know, game and, and fish. But uh, Dupree Park in our town, okay. uh, that's where we the most damage was done. And was. Uh, we lost our ball fields, softball fields. We host, on average, 44 softball tournaments a year in that park. And so that has uh, put a damper on that. And then like I said, Jacksonville High School, that's their home stadium for, for baseball. But uh, as Terry said, we've already begun the, the ordering process. Uh, our director of uh, Parks and Recreation has been on top of it from day one. And uh, the hard part now is we're ready and we're moving forward, but it's supply chain issues still mm -hmm. and things being back out. Uh, the standards, the poles for lights oh, and yeah. the lights themselves are 10 weeks out fencing 12 weeks out so we're having just a we're being held hostage by timelines for you know things that are out of our control public spaces in Sherwood well and we weren't our public spaces were not hit to the degree that theirs were but where that regionalism came in there was a tournament in Repsman Park you know for tennis that got moved over to Sherwood um, mm -hmm. We helped these guys out with baseball mm -hmm. um, so that their high schoolers had places where they could play their games and practice and so forth. And years ago, they did the same thing for us. You know, so I think that's where we, we had a lot of uh, where people had rented spaces in Burns Park, for example, and uh, we took them in to our Harmon Center and some different facilities at the Greens and, and so forth to make up that lag time to help out and certainly were as accommodating as possible to help out the other cities when it came to those things. You know what the toughest thing is, Chris? When we're dealing with FEMA, you've got to make sure it's within a certain time frame. So mm -hmm. we're right now trying to figure out when we can put the pavilions in Burns Park. So if it's over 45 years old, they're kind of going, wait a minute now. So and most of those pavilions were built we want to say in the 1960s, so mm -hmm. we have, that's what FEMA makes us do, but again, it's just part of the process that we all are having to go through. But think about Burns Park, all of us have been there, but I can remember going to Burns Park and those pavilions when I was a young kid. Sure, sure. So it's, it's, it's a process, but we're all handling it, to answer your question. 
A, a big part of surviving a storm is being warned early, and that you know involves the National Weather Service. It involves our meteorologists uh, here on television, uh, and also warning systems like tornado sirens mm -hmm. in each of your cities. Uh, did they all work to your satisfaction on Absolutely. March 31st? Absolutely, they did, and I, you know, wonderful weathermen mm -hmm. at Channel Seven and and the different stations. That was such a, a godsend, and and I will tell you that morning, you know. I'm sure they got the alerts too of, you know, we have this potential severe weather coming and our emergency management uh, person, you know, was calling me up going, you know, Mayor, there, there's a tornado and it looks like it's headed toward Sherwood. And in my mind, I'm thinking, they never hit Sherwood, <laughs> Bologna, you know, Mayflower, May some of these other places, but they always go around us. Right. We're good, you know, but I just think the fact that you guys were on camera yeah. alerting people, um, siren system worked beautifully. Mm -hmm. it, it really was a combination. I really do think that's why we didn't end up with you know, the devastation of life has a, it's really, you guys are the ones um, to really pat yourselves on the back and the wet National Weather Service. Yeah. I agree. No, I agree. Yeah, technology and television. I mean, really, that made a huge difference. Like I said, we were at work, it was a normal day. Mm -hmm. We were able to watch the weather and see, you know, hey, it's, this thing's forming in Hot Springs, moving towards, you know, Little Rock. And as it started approaching Little Rock, you know, we're like, all right, we see the tra tra trajectory, can you talk now? We, we know where it's going. And then able being able to watch it cross the river or roll through a little rock, cross the river and head right, everybody go home. You know, because of that, we're able to, to make decisions like that where before it was just a shot in the dark. You're not knowing where it's gonna go, what's gonna happen. So uh, yes, as Mary Jo said, thank you, you know, to y'all and your coverage of that, it made our life a lot easier and then actually able to save lives and get people out. Absolutely. Same here, I mean, I watched it from my office. I was, I'm was i not one of the smart ones, let's say. I didn't take care of my state. I watched it. <laughs> and because I'm looking west out one of my windows, I could see it coming. And like I say, I was watching the channels, and when I heard it said, it's it's leaving Little Rock, it's in the Arkansas River, and then I heard the next thing out, it's in Burns Park. I went, oh, that is, you know, it's hard to fathom. It really was. Mm -hmm. So. Any areas you see for improvement in terms of early notification? Were you pleased with how things went? We were very pleased. Again, I couldn't add much more than what everyone has already stated. And just, again, want to share our appreciation to you, all of the news stations, the meteorologists, yeah. and what they were able to do to really ensure we all were prepared. Yeah, we all stand on their shoulders on days like this. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been so generous with your time. One last question. You always try to take lessons away from major events like this. What have you all learned from the March 31st tornado that will make you better public officials and that will leave your cities better prepared to deal with something like this in the future? Mayor Scott, we'll start with you. I think from a leadership standpoint, uh, communication is key mm. in, in times of a crisis. And so, uh, but not only communication, uh, your very presence uh, showing up for the people uh, that we all serve and work for uh, in their most um, dire need. And uh, to be present for them, to listen to them, to comfort them, but to communicate directly with them. Mayor Hartwick? I think the biggest thing I can say is that as a mayor of the city, it was making us trying to make good decisions. And so the first thing I did was put a curfew in. And we put policemen and firemen at every location to every part of the city that was hit. So there was no looting that was taken care of. Curfews, of course, was taking care of itself, getting people there. In fact, if you was trying to get in the neighborhood, you had to show your driver's license. If it didn't match, you wouldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So as me, as a mayor of the city, our, our best thing was looking forward to making sure the city stayed safe, firemen, police, and, and again, I got a chief of staff. I've got, I'll take your hat off. You, you know, you got policemen, firemen, they, and they do their job, our linemen. Mm -hmm. These guys climb poles, yeah. and they're still doing it, and their protection is a pair of rubber gloves. So i, I got to take it off to all of our city. I mean, I'll even include energy, all the linemen climbing these poles that are some hot with trees all around them. From, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complete city effort, and I have to admire. Me and Frank talk. Mary Jo and I talk. Jeff and I, we have meetings. So it's not like we're not, it, it stops in that river. No, guess what? It keeps coming. So right on into Mary Jo and Jeff. So we as a team, as a team of mayors, we communicate. And so I can honestly say 
it's not just one city against the other. It's, it's a, as he said, Central Arkansas, we held up together and guess what? We, I say North Little Rock proud, but maybe I should just say we're all proud of the way our city performed. Central Arkansas proud. Central Arkansas. Absolutely. Yes. Mary Elmore, lessons learned from this? Lesson learned is uh, trust your people. Uh, empower your people. Surround yourself with good people and let them do what they're there for. And don't try to, to manage or micromanage during those times, but let them roll. You know, you have them there for a reason and uh, trust them. And then your volunteers, just our citizens, uh, letting them work and you know, show how much you know, they love their neighbor and their city and just supporting them, trying to give them what they need. Uh, that's the biggest takeaway. If this, you know, a situation like this happens again, uh, you I, know, I, I feel like we've got an, <laughs> yeah, I feel like we've, you know, we've got an army that's prepared and, and ready to go just because they've had practice now. And we'll give you the final word. Um, on a practical standpoint, um, for all mayors out there, it costs you nothing to have debris contracts in place. Sherwood will never be without those again because mm -hmm. Having those contracts, you're able to get people on the streets right away, and that's super important. So what we're going to be doing is actually putting together a kind of a little manual for future mayors so they know what to do so they're not kind of in that situation that we were in where you've never had to handle anything like that before. So. All right. Very well done. Mayor Frank Scott, Jr., Mayor Terry Hartwick, Mayor uh, Jeff Elmore, and Mayor Mary Jo High Townsell. Thank you all for being with us. It's Thank been you a delight guys. to Appreciate talk to you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you for all you. your yes, hard yes, work. Yes. Hey, before we go, we do want to remind you that FEMA is set to close its remaining tornado disaster recovery centers uh, in the state of Arkansas. The FEMA sites at the West Central Community Center in Little Rock, the North Little Rock Community Center, and the Bridge Church in Wynn close permanently at 6 o'clock Wednesday, June 28th. And, of course, July 3rd is that final deadline to apply for assistance. That can also be done online at disasterassistance.gov. So we wanted to share that information with you. That does it for our KETV Town Hall event. Make sure to like this program and subscribe to the KETV YouTube channel for more original content. I'm Chris May. Thanks for watching. Thank you.